So hello everyone um, and welcome on behalf of the Freedom Project and all of the Adam Smith Fellows. Um, today I'm very excited to welcome Margaret Hoover, uh, granddaughter of President Herbert Hoover, as our second speaker of the year. Uh, Margaret is a CNN contributor. She's the former member of the Bush administration White House, and she's the author of the book, American Individualism, How a New Generation of Conservatives Can Save the Republican Party. So the Freedom Project is only in its second year at Wellesley, and we are incredibly grateful for the leadership of Professor Cushman and the generosity of those who have made events like this possible. This year, we have a cohort of Adam Smith fellows who come from an incredibly diverse set of backgrounds, interests, and beliefs. Uh, yet are united in their dedication to studying and exploring freedom in all of its manifestations and especially in the classical liberal tradition. Uh, classical liberalism emphasizes the sanctity of individual rights, freedom of contract, constitutional democracy, and the rule of law. Uh, this emphasis also incorporates an appreciation for individualism and the struggle against arbitrary power in the form of both ideological dogmas and social conformity. As Adam Smith Fellows, we admire dissidents, and those who are both brave enough and skilled enough to articulate their ideas, even if they are unpopular or breaking from the status quo. We recognize the importance of these individuals in preserving many of the classical liberal freedoms that are so easy to take for granted, and in advocating for those who may not have these freedoms at all. As students, we endeavor to think critically and to evaluate ideas based on their merits, rather than whether or not they align with our own ideologies or the dominant ideology. It is in this spirit that we have invited Margaret as an example of the leadership and thinking that we value. As an advocate for constructive change in the Republican Party, a champion of individual rights, and a supporter of gay marriage, Margaret comes to us with a unique and admirable perspective. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Margaret. So many familiar faces. I just had a wonderful dinner with the Adam Smith Fellows and uh, really enjoyed our talk and I'm so glad most of you migrated over here so we can continue our conversation because we actually didn't get all the way around the table so we can maybe get to that in Q&A. Um, but thank you Marilyn for a very thoughtful introduction. Thank you Professor Cushman for having me here and for doing what you do with the Freedom Project at Wellesley because I mentioned to some of you at dinner that I, um, in some ways, am a, am a fellow compatriot as a product of a women's college. However, I went to a women's college that did not have a Freedom Project and would have been very, very grateful for that space to have been carved out at uh, Bryn Mawr, where I went and was one of my senior year five Republicans uh, out of an entire campus of well, 1,300. So you guys do the math on what fraction that is. I know we have a math major with us. Um, I am from Colorado. I went to Davidson College for two years, and then I transferred to Bryn Mawr. I did abroad studies in Mexico and in Bolivia and in China. Go abroad. By the way, if you can work it out, I think studying abroad, some of you are abroad right now because you're not from your home country. Uh, this is not your home country, but the value of the abroad experience, I think, in undergraduate education is extremely important. It was totally invaluable to me. Uh, I majored in Spanish language literature, and I had a minor in political science. And I loved languages, and I loved uh, being immersed in languages. So when I graduated from Bryn Mawr after having been immersed in Spanish a lot throughout the course of my high school and college, I decided I needed to be immersed in Mandarin. So I went and worked in Taiwan, Taipei, Taiwan, for a Taiwan, Chinese law firm, Taiwanese law firm, uh, and got there, and on my very first day at work, um, well, it was fine, uh, until about 8 o'clock that night, because it was 12 hours ahead of East Coast time, and that was 9-11, 2001. And I actually decided on my first day in China that I'd probably not spend the entire two years there because the transformative experience of being abroad uh, in Taipei in a, in a year and in a moment that so transformed everybody's geopolitical understanding um, and sort of the priorities, uh, the pri my priority, I think the, the outpouring of patriotism in the United States um, appealed to me on a pretty deep level and I decided I would scratch the itch that was the interest in, in being part of the functioning of our democracy 
that I really hadn't explored in my formal education. I think some of you are poli-sci majors, you have an opportunity to go intern in Washington or, or volunteer on campaigns, and I never did any of that in my undergraduate work, um, but really felt compelled to after 9-11. Uh, so I moved to Washington, D.C. after a year in Taipei. I worked on Capitol Hill in the House of Representatives uh, for a Cuban-American congressman, actually, um, a guy named Mario diaz Velarte, who I know we have a Cuban-American with us. She may have heard of him before. Um, it was great because I got to use my Spanish. And then had an opportunity to go work on President Bush's re-election campaign. I then, after that, went and worked in the White House. Um, for President Bush. I was in the Office of Management and Budget, and I also worked for Karl Rove in his political office. And then um, went to the Department of Homeland Security for a tenure, and then moved to New York to work for Rudy Giuliani when he was going to run for president. And met my husband there, became a contributor at Fox News, where I was on air for four years, and then was poached by CNN. Many people ask why I bothered leaving Fox News. Um, and I, no conservative really argues with me when I say they offered me a better deal. <laughs> People say, you know, capitalism trumps all arguments, I think. Um, so I've, I'm at CNN now, and I am also the president of an organization called American Unity Fund, which works within the Republican Party and within the gay rights movement to modernize the Republican Party on the issues of gay rights and um, to help bring freedom to marry to all Americans so that the ideals of the Declaration are fully realized to gay Americans. I'm a Republican primarily because the ideas that I grew up with or the ideas I was exposed to growing up was that uh, the Republican Party was closer to being the party of individual freedom uh, when it came to the things that I thought made this country great. Um, are the issues that define it, debts and deficits. The Republican Party was a party that was taking these issues more seriously. Um, education reform, which I believe education reform is the civil rights issue of this generation. And by the way, I, I say that as an LGBT advocate, like a, a, a real agitator on gay rights. I actually think the civil rights issue of this generation is the fact that kids are born in inner cities from certain zip codes and have no educational opportunity based on the zip codes that they're born into. And that is a horrifying thought in a country that pretends to be, doesn't pretend to be, we really are a country of opportunity for people, but we have ghettoized our education system. And I think that the answer to this is school choice and, and real in applying individual freedom to our education system. Um, other issues such as immigration reform and the environment. I, I'm a conservative environmentalist. I come from the West. I believe that we all need to do our part to make sure we take care of the environment. I don't, I'm not a climate change denier. I believe that climate change is happening. I think it's compelling evidence that it's happening, but I don't also think that there's a silver bullet to solving it. And many of the solutions from the left seem to me to want one-size-fits-all solutions that would dampen our economic growth and economic freedom. And so I, I think that there are things that we can do to be responsible about our, our uh, CO2 emissions. I think pursuing natural gas, pursuing nuclear energy. There are many things that we can voluntarily do to decrease greenhouse gas emissions um, without debilitating the economic engine that has made us the envy of the world. Uh, so, so mostly, you know, and, and there's this history in the Republican Party that I think is really compelling. This is the party, by the way, of the suffragettes and of abolition. I mean, this really, at its founding, was the party of individual freedom that agitated for individual freedom. And as I was in college, I had an opportunity to take a class with a guy named Di David Eisenhower, who happens to be the guy who Camp David was named after. He's General Eisenhower's grandson, and he taught this class at Penn called Communication in the American Presidency. So this is a small anecdote to how important your college studies can be to your future. Because the whole point of the class was that you took, there's one paper, one grade. Um, the only thing that matters is what you turned in at the end. It was also a great format for a class, right? Uh, and and you, you picked one speech that an American president gave and you wrote a paper about it. So, you know, I, Herbert Hoover was my great-grandfather. And I thought this was a perfect opportunity to learn more about Herbert Hoover. 
And I stumbled across this speech that he gave in 1920. 1928, based on a book he had written in 1922 called American Individualism, which is also the title of my book. I borrowed it, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But Hoover, let me tell you, he was an orphan from Iowa, born in 1864, 74, had absolutely no means, no education, no resources, uh, with no parents, was sent west to live with an aunt and uncle in Oregon, stumbled upon Stanford University when it was opening up, worked his entire way through, graduated with $40 in his pocket, and ended up at his first job shoveling ore in the bottom of a mine on the graveyard shift for $2 a week. And worked his way up to getting a job for a British consulting firm in Western Australia. And through his own intellect and initiative, happened upon a very high-producing gold vein that ended up producing the majority of the world's gold for the next 75 years. It wasn't just luck. There was a lot of luck involved. But his success with this adventure, for his bosses, by the way, he didn't, he didn't get enormously wealthy, but his firm did. Um, but he was promoted up, and he went next, uh, cabled, uh, he actually cabled a marriage proposal to my great-grandmother across the Pacific Ocean, went to Monterey, California, married her, and the next day they went to China and they arrived just in time for the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, after that, they, they circled the globe. They were the last Americans, among the last encampment of Americans and foreigners that were in Beijing, well, in Tianjin, uh, at, the, at the end of the Boxer Rebellion. A German mail boat rescued them, and they spent the next 20 years engaged in, in mining endeavors for this British firm, uh, to the extent that he ended up having this incredibly global experience with with mining ventures on every continent except Antarctica. So that his path around the world really followed the tide of revolution around the globe at the time. He had the Boxer, he had the Boxer Rebellion that kicked him out of China. And then this is the time where monarchies were falling apart and popular governments were arising. The Bolshevik, the Bolshevik Revolution, World War I, the rise of fascism in Europe. And so Hoover's life became this practical, interaction with political theories practically applied. And he was able to see what worked and what didn't with his own eyes. He was in a position in 1914 as a private citizen, an American, living in London, because it was the capital of mining finance, to uh, witness the German invasion of Belgium, the English blockade of Belgium, and answer a plea by both the Germans and the English to organize food relief to 10 million Belgians who would have starved because all of, no food supplies could get into Belgium where 80% of their food was, was imported and they couldn't get through the blockade. So it was left to an American who, because America wasn't yet in the war, to provide humanitarian relief. And through his humanitarian efforts, he created this international nonprofit organization to supply food to the Belgians, which had, by the way, never happened before. That, that it was called the Committee for the Relief of Belgium, and this became the template for UNICEF. This became the template for international humanitarian food relief for, that we have now, frankly. Uh, so, so Hoover, was the, he was the only diplomat that could go on both sides of the lines throughout World War I, because he was coming in the name of peace, and he was feeding um, people who were faced with famine. So Hoover's wondering, why am I this orphan from basically, you know, impoverished, not impoverished, but very, very dismal means uh, in a position now to feed the world and to, to feed starving people. He went on to feed Russians during uh, the requisitioning of the Russian famine in 1921 and 1922. Um, and he began looking at these economic systems and these political systems around the world saying, what, what is it about uh, the American system that I, a, an orphan of no means, have arisen to the stature whereby I am able to help people from, you know, people in, in enormously uh, dis unfortunate circumstances in, in other parts of the globe. And he decided that it was the American system that was unique. And he decided he would characterize the American system because he felt like it was under attack at that time. Um, so he, he called it American individualism. And American individualism, he said, is a economic, a political, and a social system whereby a society is built on its individuals, and it creates a, a space that is safe for individuals to innovate and to create 
and to apply their individual spark of genius to the marketplace and to their communities. But he believed that American individualism, he, he, he labeled it American. So it's not just individualism, it's American individualism. And the thing that made it American to him was that it was grounded in a very strong sense of community. That there is a responsibility as an individual to give back to your communities, to serve your communities, and to, to be an active member of a community. And that, I mean, that was what motivated his, his answer to, to the calls to help feed the Belgians. He felt that there was this, this, this uh, he had a responsibility to his, to his fellow humans, to, to, to other individuals, to make sure that, that 10 million people didn't starve to death in World War I. So American individualism is this sense of rugged individualism imbued with a community spirit. And that really, really resonates with me. And I had many experiences in Washington working uh, for the Bush administration, whereby I, I came to really agree even more strongly with some certain Republican policies. Um, but then I had other experiences that I thought, ooh, the Republican Party could probably reform in this area and make it more consistent with its own principles and also more palatable to a new generation of Americans. And so in 2008, Republicans, as we all know, got trounced. I mean, John McCain only got, uh, you know, 45% uh, uh, of the electorate. You know, Barack Obama gets 55%. But when you look at it and you look at who, uh, which portions of the population came out strongly, uh, for President Obama, the millennial generation, which is you guys. Um, millennials, the first to come of age in the new millennium, born basically at the beginning of the Reagan era to the end of the Clinton presidency. You guys are smack in the middle of it. The youngest are 14, the oldest are 24. No, no I'm sorry, the oldest are 33. So you guys are right in the middle. Um, and it occurred to me that uh, the Republican Party not only didn't get the youth, they had no idea why youth came out so much for, for Barack Obama, they, um, they, 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 just, they didn't also understand how urgent it was to begin to try to connect. Because in politics, political identity and partisan identity solidifies like cement. It sort of starts soft, and then over time it hardens. So if you get a, a generation of people coming to vote for President Obama, they're gonna, they, they vote for him once. If they vote three times for the same political party, the likelihood that they will self-identify with that party for the next 20 years is very, very high. So I felt that there was this urgency. You know, we, they, millennials, the first ones came to vote in 2004, they voted for John Kerry by nine percentage points. In 2008, they voted for Barack Obama by 33, 34 percentage points. So I felt like we had this window where we could start to make our case to, uh, to the millennial generation. And so that's why I wrote my book. And I wrote the book um, to sort of to, to make a case to millennials that the Republican Party could, could answer some of their concerns with policies, but also to communicate to the Republican Party who the millennials were, who, like literally who you guys are, what your sensibilities are, because they don't know. They literally have, um, there's like this really a gap of understanding between you know, the, the stereotypical old white guys who are running the party and this sort of youth movement that was, created this outpouring for President Obama. Uh, so what I normally do when I go around and I talk about my book is I'm talking to a group of old white men, <laughs> some women, and I'm telling them who millennials are, like who you guys are as a generation. And so I tell them things like they're the largest generation in American history, that there are 27 million more millennials than there are of them, baby boomers, and that there's 17 million more millennials than there are of me, Generation X. And I tell them characteristics about the millennials. Now, mostly they think that millennials are these like antisocial, uh, self-absorbed, lazy, tech-obsessed, um, short attention span, no work ethic, you know, kids that basically never had to work for anything. They just got it all handed to them. And that, like, honestly, that's, that's the caricature, right? Um, but what I try to do is explain the sensibilities of the generation so we can make a case for connecting to them. So I tell them things like, you might not know that millennials, 40% of them have tattoos. Like, did you guys know that? So 40% of millennials actually have tattoos. That baffles them. But it may not seem weird to you guys, because it's like a tattoo. Mostly they're small, mostly they're hidden. Some, 
20% of people who have tattoos in your generation have more than one. It's like kind of not a big deal, right? Blows their minds. Um, I tell them that, and tell me if this you know, resonates, but I tell them that this generation cares about being part of something larger than themselves. They care about contributing positively to the world. They're not just out for themselves. They really are um, in it to be part of something larger and connected to their communities. I think this is the, this is the um, paradox of Facebook, right? It's, it's sort of a place where you go on and you tell people about yourself, but it's, it's not individualistic. It's, it's a social network, right? You're intrinsically connected to your community. Um, you're quite global in nature, right? You, you are connected to people in other parts of the world. You're sort of naturally internationalists without really needing to call yourself that because the internet has broken down barriers in so many ways. 40% um, non-white. 20% um, at least have one immigrant parent. Um, the, the demographic nature of the millennial generation represents the demographic changes in the country. And as I was thinking about sort of the nature of the millennial generation, I realized this is very similar to Herbert Hoover's trajectory. Stick with me. Hoover was a technologist in his time. He pioneered mining engineering technologies that hadn't existed before. He was a globalist. He'd operated on five continents before he was 40. Um, in many ways, he was an innovator. In, in many ways, um, American individualism, this idea that we're individuals but we're connected to one another and responsible for one another, fits the millennial ethos, which is why, as a Republican trying to make a case to a new generation, I realized that in many ways Herbert Hoover had, you know, not meaning to, but there were, there were connections between the ethos he um, he lived in and his, his sort of moral compass and the values of the millennial generation. And so I use that as a framework in my book to make the case that there's a Republican tradition for being individualistic but community oriented, for devoting yourself to service to others, and, um, and, and, and I use that to make the case that, that there really is, bounded in tradition, a model for reforming the Republican Party that is consistent with our history. Some things that, one thing that blows away the people that I mostly talk to is that millennials overall have a very positive view of government. Most Republicans, the old white guys that I mostly go talk to, you know, the, 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 they were geared in the, in the Reagan tradition where it's government is the problem. And uh, overall, overwhelmingly, millennials feel like government's a good thing. It's not bad, it's not necessarily invasive, it can be a force of good in the world. So that's one area that I think needs to sort of be connected, we need to make a case to millennials about. The other is um, their politics are pragmatic and resist rigid ideology. You know, most millennials are, um, they're like 20, 40% call themselves moderate, 29% liberal, 28% conservative. You know, you guys sort of know, and I sort of see some nodding, that this is, you guys are a generation that isn't into the split screen. You're not into the left versus right and the screaming, but you're interested in pragmatic results. You're interested in getting the ball down the field. You're interested in doing real things and that the government should work for you. And if people who are in government aren't making it work, get them out and get other people in. It's not about parties, but it's about doing something good. Um, that's, that's one place where the Republican Party, I think, really needs to, to um, sort of change and adjust its rhetoric to appeal to a new generation. Uh, so what I do in the book is I, I take uh, certain issues, generational theft, debt and deficits. This is an area where we can connect. I think the Republican Party has a layup with, with, with millennials. I think we can um, really make the case that the Republican Party is the party of fiscal responsibility. It's the party that is going to make sure you get your Social Security and your Medicare only because we're going to have to reform it in order for you to get it. Um, we have I think a leg up on the education crisis in this country. I think the real solutions for the education crisis